Welcome, everybody. I'm Michael Barr, the Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my pleasure to be here today to host this conversation. This is part of our Conversations Across Differences series, a series the Ford School has been producing for the last four years with politicians and policymakers from across the ideological spectrum. This event today is co-sponsored by the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, the Domestic Policy Corps student organization here at Ford, and Detroit Public Television. We're grateful for the support of this series, including a recent generous gift from Tom Tuft, which will help us continue to bring the essential conversations to our community and the public. Today, we're joined by two dynamic representatives, members of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Both have served in Iraq, Representative Alyssa Slotkin as an intelligence officer, and Representative Peter Meyer in the Army Reserves. So they bring that national security perspective. They're deeply tied to Michigan. Representative Meyer was elected this past November, so he's been in Congress now for just over six weeks. In addition to his tour in Iraq, he worked with a veterans-based disaster response organization and led humanitarian efforts in South Sudan and the Philippines, as well as in New York and Oklahoma after uh, storms. He went on to run an international NGO organization's advisory operations in southern Afghanistan. We know of his family in Michigan for four generations as the innovators who created a great food retail business from humble beginnings in 1934. Representative Slotkin, Democrat from the 8th District, is serving her second term in Congress. Before her election in 2018, she had been in a series of senior national security posts at the CIA, Department of Defense, and in the White House, under both Presidents Bush and Obama, including as Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Her family has also been in Michigan for many generations. The family business has a food tie as well. High-grade foods produced our beloved Ballpark Franks, which were first served at Tiger Stadium. In the interest of full disclosure, let me also say that there are uh, ties to the Ford School. Representative Meyer's um, father serves on the Ford School Committee, and my son happens to work for Representative Slotkin. Uh, welcome, uh, both of you, for this uh, conversation. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. Uh, we have some really serious issues we're grappling with right now as a country. Uh, we've just seen uh, an unprecedented violent attack uh, on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. We saw the impeachment of uh, President uh, Trump and then an impeachment trial in which he was acquitted. Uh, these are really difficult issues that I know both of you are uh, grappling with um, uh, very much. Let me just start by asking, I, I don't know the answer to this, were either of you up in the Capitol on January 6th? And, and what, what was that like on a personal level? Uh, maybe Peter, you could start. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much for um, having us here today. And I'm pleased to join my colleague, Representative Slotkin. Um, on January 6th, I was in the House gallery, so in the House chambers, uh, watching the Electoral College certification debate around Arizona taking place. And, um, you know, we ended up getting um, barricaded inside the gallery uh, for about the first half an hour that folks, uh, that the, you know, armed group entered the Capitol. Um, after about the 30 minute mark, Capitol Police evacuated us from the chambers, uh, you know, rushed us out, put us in an elevator, hit the sub basement, and then we were wandering in the tunnels, uh, trying to find, figure out what parts of the complex were still secure, knowing that the Cannon complex had been evacuated. Um, you know, we made our way to a cafeteria and then later to a committee hearing room uh, where we were um, for several hours until we were eventually uh, allowed to get back to other places in the Capitol complex. And uh, for me, I was on my way to the gallery, walking through those same tunnels, um, going to the floor of the house. Um, and when I uh, came to the staircase that would have led me right up to the house floor, probably the first or second stair, I could hear yelling and screaming and breaking glass. And what I thought was a, a flashbang, like a crowd control measure, which was probably a gunshot now that we sort of know more of the facts of the day. And I literally, my mind clicked into, um, you know, prior training, which is just get off the X, get off the X, get off the target, get off the bullseye. And I just, you know, hauled myself back to uh, my office and locked myself in. Fellow Michigan representative Andy Levin called me. He couldn't get back to his office. So 
he and his chief came and, and uh, spent the next few hours in my office where I spent the next, uh, you know, time, couple hours at least on the phone with the senior ranks of the Pentagon, making sure that they sent the National Guard and making sure that they heard from someone who, you know, wasn't, um, you know, this wasn't my first rodeo of a, of a dangerous experience, um, but making sure they understood that we had lost control of the situation. There were weapons in the compound um, and that they needed to get over uh, quickly. It, it sounds like a completely harrowing experience. And um, I, I'm so sorry on behalf of the whole country that either of you had to go uh, go through that. What do you make of the um, the reaction of the the White House? And it sounds like, Alyssa, you were on the phone with the Defense Department. Were they responsive in terms of uh, getting, and I know the National Guard eventually came, but was that a a tough conversation to have? It, it wasn't a tough conversation. I think, you know, we will have plenty of time for for lessons learned on on preparedness leading up to that event, because anyone, of course, from Michigan would have known there was going to be violence on that day. Um, in fact, I told my staff in written guidance, no one is to come to the Capitol compound. I just assumed the violence would be outside, as we've seen similar things happen, you know, in my own district in Lansing. Um, but, um, you know, I think context matters. And to be honest, the senior ranks of the Pentagon were very chastened after what happened with Lafayette Square in June, where uniformed military helped clear peaceful protesters so that the president could have a photo op. They were lambasted for that. Uh, we had, you know, uh, helicopters, military helicopters involved in crowd control by flying low over the city of Washington, D.C. And we know we had active duty troops just outside the, the bounds of the city. So um, they were very cautious leading up to this event not to have a repeat situation where they were accused of overly militarizing a situation um, and um, were very hesitant. And even the small numbers that were called out ahead of time, no weapons were authorized. They had really, really conscribed, you know, uh, constrained, excuse me, rules of engagement. So they were dealing with now sort of the pendulum swinging and everyone saying, come here, come here, come here. Um, they were not mustered at a nearby armory. They were not prepared. Um, now the National Guard needs to be called out by someone. They don't just arrive on their own. Um, so uh, like I said, there'll be lots of time for conversation, but I never was under the impression that there was a problem, a political problem, sending them after they were requested, just that they weren't in place to respond as quickly as we would have liked. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Peter, I wonder what were things like in terms of were you kind of canvassing with Republicans during this time, or were you all jumbled together as a as a group across party lines? What what were the conversations like while you were waiting for um, essentially a rescue? Yeah, it, it was definitely um, very much a, a bipartisan, um, cross partisan mix. You know, there was no distinction when you were evacuating. Actually, it was uh, Representative Dean Phillips. Uh, uh, Democratic side of the aisle, he was taking video and I hadn't seen it until um, I think Friday. And I realized he was right behind me as we were mm. kind of fleeing the um, the house gallery. But I guess what was kind of going through my mind, and I think several of us had this conversation, was um, you always kind of assume that there was a plan, right? Um, you know, I hear back the Cold War and, okay, you got the Greenbrier and there's all these continuity of government operations. And, um, you know, I, I understand that there are scenarios where you don't necessarily want to brief what may be sort of a, a classified or, or kind of confidential uh, plan ahead of time so that it doesn't leak. And what was most dispiriting was, you know, you have um, you know, the vice, you have the next three people in the chain of command, right, in the presidential line of succession, I should say, um, all in the same building. And, and we're all just forced to, to scatter. Um, there was no secret bunker somewhere that everyone goes in and is secured in. Um, I mean, we were first in a, a random cafeteria with big windows looking out and having no idea, having, knowing at the time that pipe bombs have been discovered and neutralized in adjacent buildings that, you know, shots had been fired and at least one person was shot and killed, um, you know, that, that folks had stormed the Capitol and were in a cafeteria. 
um, or, or wandering through tunnels, several dozen, you know, um, I think we had groups of 25 to 40 members kind of wandering through these tunnels, Capitol Police sprinting in the other direction and trying to flag them down and say, where the heck are we going right now? Yeah. Um, not knowing if you'd turn a quarter and, and encounter folks who had gotten in uh, unauthorized. So, mm. you know, in the realm of lessons learned, um, there are many, many, many lessons. Um, but I guess it was just that sense that um, I, we had assumed that there was a plan. And when push came to shove, there was nothing. Do you think that, um, do you guys think that there should be a, a 9-11 kind of uh, commission to investigate what happened uh, at the Capitol that day? Is that kind of the right next step in terms of trying to figure out uh, what, what reforms need to be done? Yeah, and actually we had some movement on that officially yesterday when the Speaker of the House announced essentially what is a 9-11 a type um, style commission um, with a uh, uh, retired general honore as the head of it. So um, it is extremely important that it, it be independent. Mm -hmm. it, it's extremely important for all the reasons Peter just mentioned, right? Um, for a branch of government not to have a continuity of operations, continuity of government plan, um, we could have had what we literally call in national security circles, a decapitation event where the top leadership are, are wounded, are hurt, are God forbid killed. Um, and we need to understand how, how the, the succeeding like failures that took, that took place that day in preparation and in response. So I'm glad that it's independent. It's now been announced. I think it's still forming because I think we need accountability on that kind of event um, in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, uh, to represent Osaka's point, I mean, 100%, it, it has to be something that's beyond reproach, uh, that isn't viewed as a, a weaponized for political ends uh, entity. But, you know, I, I think obviously it was a tragedy that, that five folks died, and including a Capitol Police officer, two more, um, you know, lost their lives to suicide in the subsequent days. It's important to remember that I'm, I'm, it's almost a miracle that it wasn't worse. Correct. I'm talking to some of the police officers who were very conscious of the fact that they did not, that if, if, if gunfire erupted, if they shot um, at folks who were, who were coming in, if an exchange occurred, um, they were probably outgunned. Um, it's, it's easy to imagine a scenario where not only, um, you know, where multiple you know, if dozens, I mean, potentially hundreds of people could have lost their lives that day, um, in, including, you know, senior government officials, including, you know, those those next three individuals in the presidential line of succession. Um, there are there are scenarios, there are, you know, um, ways that that spins so dramatically out of control um, that, you know, we should be we should be feeling very there, we, we escaped what could have been much, much more of a catastrophic event. Um, and that's all the more reason to make sure that we never allow anything like this to occur again. We learn the right lessons. We have accountability for what happened. We clear some of the fog and uncertainty. Um, I've been incredibly disappointed that to this day, apart from some of the things presented in the impeachment trial, unless I experienced it directly or read about it on Twitter, I don't have any more information than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been, you know, we're, we're six weeks out from this just about, and, and it's still a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables. And obviously this is in a massively complex investigation the FBI is conducting, um, but we need to make sure that there is a full accounting. So it sounds like you all have not been briefed systematically, even on what happened that day, let alone um, the potential failures. No, I, I think, um, we were given a security briefing in the days after the attack, literally a physical security briefing um, that laid out some of the threat streams that continued after the attack against elected officials. Um, and um, um, but we haven't had what I guess from from my background, I'm sure from Peter's background would be a true sort of update brief after action report, any of that. Um, and the, you know, I know that this is feeding into a conversation about how, what do we um, continue to do about security now that the impeachment trial is over. Um, 
obviously no one likes having so many uniformed military around such a symbolic building. No one likes the fences, you know, no one likes all of that. But the truth is, I, I don't personally have a great handle on what Capitol Police's plan is to secure us going forward, to, to ensure that we wouldn't have some sort of breach. And whether that's the, you know, similar folks to we saw on January 6th, or another group, right? And I think it exposed vulnerabilities that had clearly long been there. Um, but um, you can imagine lawmakers want to make sure that before all that security dissipates, um, and that includes the Michigan National Guard who were pulled back to go secure, um, help secure the Capitol. Um, we all want them to go home, but we need to understand the plan for securing the building after they depart. And, and Alyssa and I were out um, at FedEx Field um, thanking all the Michigan National Guardsmen and, and Air Guard who were out there and, and um, for the work that they did. And then, what, 72 hours later, they get recalled back to the Capitol. So, yeah. I mean, there's... Um, it's it's clear, and we've seen this in some of the resignations and the statements of no confidence by, by some of their members that the Capitol Police are going through an incredibly you know trying leadership moment. Um, but but to Alyssa's point, I mean the vulnerabilities that were exposed, others could take advantage of. Um, how there was not some you know additional provocative entities in that crowd, um, how other. Uh, malign actors, um, international malign actors didn't see this as an opportunity. Um, I mean, this, as I said before, it is so easy to imagine how this spins dramatically and catastrophically out of control. And that's all the more reason that we have to make sure that we have a full accounting, we learn every lesson, and we apply the right ones uh, going forward. Let's um, let's talk more broadly about the domestic terrorist threat um, in the United States. Some people think that's the biggest threat we're currently facing. What should we be doing about it? What should we do be doing about uh, the rise of white um, extremist, you know, nationalism, white supremacist organizations uh, that were involved in this attack? How do we how do we move forward on a national security basis, not just with respect to the capital, but broader issues of domestic uh, terrorism in the United States. Maybe Alyssa, you could start us out. Sure. Um, well, this is the some of the bread and butter that I know Peter and I will be working on this year. I just became the chairwoman of the subcommittee on Intel and counterterrorism, um, which will be basically taking on domestic terrorism um, uh, this year. And um, the, the truth is, um, I think, you know, the 9-11 era, those 20 years after 9-11, have officially been capped off, you know, where the greatest threats are external to the United States, where we're looking at terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS and others, um, and, and lone wolves who are associated with them here in the United States. I think the division between us as Americans is the single greatest national security threat. And I mean that not in terms of just physical security, but our inability to govern because of that division, that pr the problems it creates, even at the local level, which, which we're seeing now mm -hmm. so clearly, I think is really a risk to us moving forward and having the life we all want here. Um, and um, But it's important to learn some of the lessons from the, the 20 years of the 9-11 of the era and not repeat, frankly, some of the mistakes. Some of those mistakes involved overreacting, right? We had been attacked. We had had this symbolic... Um, you know, event, loss of life. Um, and so, frankly, in those early days after 9-11, we made some bad decisions, right? We opened up Gitmo. We allowed detention, rendition, torture. We launched the war in Iraq on false pretenses. I mean, we reacted because we were emotional because we had been attacked. And Lord knows, I got into national security because of that emotion. Um, but we can't do the same thing with domestic terrorism, particularly because it's so sensitive right? Because freedom of speech issues are wound up in it. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at it and looking at whether we need additional domestic terrorism laws, right? But also at some of the things that, frankly, we can be doing to, to affirmatively educate people, right? I'm really into um, mandatory Holocaust education across the country. So people understand the symbols that we saw out on the lawn of the Capitol as I walked through that morning, right? Um, and um, making sure that we are appropriately resourced for the threat. 
you know, from for Peter and I, you know, if you were like, really a up and coming national security type in the 9-11 era, you focused on external terrorist groups. The resources, the support, the interest in domestic terrorism wasn't really the hot place to go in national security. And so we've under-resourced it. And that's at a time when the FBI will say that they have more open domestic terrorism cases than they do foreign. So we've got to be resourced to the threat. And those are some of the things we'll be looking at. And Peter's a member of the committee, which is great. Mm -hmm. And, and as um, as Alyssa's on uh, intelligence and counterterrorism uh, as the uh, uh, the lead, I'm the ranking member on oversight, management, and accountability on homeland security. So you know there'll definitely be some opportunities to be very mindful of um, where you know how did we get to the point where this threat was not adequately assessed. Um, and, and to Alyssa's point, I'm also deeply concerned and want to make sure we don't overreact. We don't infringe on civil liberties. The biggest difference between domestic terrorism and international terrorism is within the confines of our country, our government has a monopoly of violence. You know, we have legitimate authorities. We have law enforcement and investigative apparatuses. You know, we have the ability to deal with these acts, you know, through appropriate criminal mechanisms. Um, we don't have those by and large overseas. That's what makes international terrorism so hard is you have areas that are non-permissive where our forces, um, our, our law enforcement, you know, cannot operate without some type of military or, or kind of lethal support. Um, so I think we need to, and then this is some of the conversations we've been having, um, be open to what might need to change. But my bigger question is, um, is this a question of, of staffing? Is it a question of resources? Is it a question of focus and attention? You know, or um, is it a question of uh, permissions and having the statutory grounding to to go after and ensure that those who are seeking to sow political violence, you know, don't find opportunities? Um, that's something that's going to be coming out, I, I should hope, of the 9-11 style commission um, of, of the independent investigation that will have that uh, more fuller accounting. I don't want us to, in this immediate moment, overreact and potentially cause more damage. And we've seen with some of the, you know, it, it can be a very slippery slope on domestic terrorism. You know, at what point does First Amendment, you know, right to protest, right to, to engage in, in speech, um, where does that transgress and at what point does the FBI start to go in? Because even if we look before the 9-11 era, um, going back to the civil rights movement, there were longstanding abuses of, of peaceful groups um, and, and the FBI, especially under J. Edgar Hoover, you know, infiltrating and, and recording and, and blackmailing you know, individuals who were engaged in, in peaceful protest and, and, and expressing, you know, their um, political beliefs um, that didn't cross into violence, didn't reach that level. So we need to strike that right balance or else I don't think we'll be ultimately putting the country into the direction it needs to go. It's really helpful. Um, let's spend just a little bit longer on this moment, and then I'm going to broaden to some other topics. Uh, obviously, we, we just came out of an impeachment trial uh, President Trump was uh, quitted, uh, although there were 57 uh, members of the Senate uh, who voted to convict President Trump of inciting the riot on the Capitol uh, on January 6th, including seven Republicans. Um, both of you voted to impeach. Um, uh, Peter, you were more uh, uh, alone on, on your side, not fully alone, but more alone in your side in doing that. And I know uh, have been uh, criticized um, uh, strongly from a number of Republicans for that stance. I wonder if uh, if both of you could just say a little bit about your decision uh, with respect to impeachment, and then maybe you know more uh, critically, what does the acquittal mean for the health of our democracy, uh, the future of our institutions? How worried should we be about? Not just the again the particular moments uh, of January six, but more broadly the strength of our institutions, our democratic institutions. So maybe Peter, if you could start us out, and then Alyssa, that would be great. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was one of ten Republicans in the House uh, to vote for impeachment. Um, this was a vote that was uh, a, a vote of conscience, and when I say that, I don't just mean we were voting with our conscience. I mean this was not what's called a whipped vote. So leadership and the whip team weren't going around and saying, you know, we recommend you vote this way. It was um, up to each individual member. And that's um, I don't think we've ever had a, 
an impeachment. I mean, we don't have a, a strong track record of them. You know, historically, you can only there's only a handful. Uh, but where you know this, um, at least in the party of the president, where that was not a, a whipped vote, um, which doesn't mean there weren't you know tremendous consequences, especially at the local level, and, and folks feeling you know deeply frustrated. But in the days leading up to it, I had a number of conversations um, with folks back in the district. And to me, the most striking and, and frankly um, terrifying element of some of those conversations were the people who immediately shifted to a denial mode. Um, it wasn't supporters of, of the former president that stormed the Capitol. It was BLM. It was Antifa. Right. I mean, the, the rapid proliferation of just absolutely unfounded ideas um, that were uh, a means of denial, a means of avoiding accountability, um, or you know, trying to hang their hat on the, the smallest procedural um, grounds. To me, it was ultimately a question of, you know, are, is the Re Republican Party a party of rule of law, a party of holding leaders to a high standard? Um, you know, I, I talk to people who, you know, when we were evacuated, um, were, you know, strong believers that, you know, the, the, they lost complete confidence in the president, were, you know, discussing the 25th Amendment and whether or not to openly support that, uh, and then a week later, uh, vote to acquit. So you can, you can see how this kind of reversion back to a, a pretty unsustainable uh, mean um, occurs. And I think we've seen the same in a lot of rhetoric from um, officials of my party who, you know, were openly condemning you know, in the days that followed, uh, and then kind of backpedaled so hard the mm -hmm. chain fell off the bicycle and uh, or chain fell off the sprocket and was dragging on the ground. So, you know, I'm I don't I think when when we slip into political violence, that is a line that um, cannot be tolerated, that cannot be excused, that cannot be um, you know treated with kid gloves. Um, and and we saw that if it wasn't for the president propagating. Um, and, and insisting that this had been a landslide election victory on November 3rd that was stolen from him, and that January 6th was the day to stop that steal. Without those two, the violence of the Capitol never happened. Uh, without encouraging more folks to come on January 6th, uh, we wouldn't have had the, not only encouraging them to come, but in that speech, telling them, go to the Capitol Granted, he said march peacefully. He also said fight or fighting 20 times. And, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Um, you know, you can try to squirm out of, uh, out of the accountability question. But at the end of the day, the folks who were arrested at the Capitol, they were doing what they felt Donald Trump wanted them to do. Um, and if he was disappointed or, or horrified at what had occurred at the Capitol in those immediate moments... Um, he wouldn't have, he would have been reacting immediately to shut that down, to tell people to go away. It took him hours. Um, he was still trying to get senators to, to delay. Um, he was still tweeting attacks at the vice president while the vice president and his wife and his daughter were in the building and people who were roaming the hallways were chanting, hang Mike Pence. And there was a gallow erected outside. Um, so to me, it was an unconscionable dereliction of duty. Um, it, it disqualified him from that office, from he abandoned his oath of office. Um, and, you know, it, I will be very honest in the in the days leading up to it. It's, it was the worst week of my life, not because of what occurred, not just because of what occurred at the Capitol, um, but knowing that this was a decision that would deeply disappoint um, so many folks in my district. But at the end of the day, um, if, if the Republican Party is one that, that coddles QAnon, that um, gives in to the darkest, you know, and, and most feverish uh, corners of the online uh, fringe, uh, you know, that that is a sad and dangerous direction for the Republican Party to go in and for the country to go in. Yeah, and I would, I would just add, um, you know, when you work alongside the military, you are taught that leadership climate is set from the top. And, you know, watching frankly, the years of messaging um, to the president's followers using his mantle at the White House to set a tone of permissiveness around hate and violence. That is the legacy we're going to be living with long beyond what happened in the Senate last week, right? And this is what makes it, I think, 
even harder as we go forward. You know, Peter made a decision that risked his career. When I was going through the first impeachment, people told me that's the end of your career. Um, and I think it's critical that people be willing to stand up for what they believe in. But now the work of trying to bring the country back together in some form or fashion really begins when the cameras turn off on Capitol Hill. And just in the past week, right, in my own district, we've had pastors and church services Zoom bombed by the KKK and people threatening to rape and kill our pastors, people Zoom bombing our city council meetings, kids bullied at school because of their political views. It has seeped into the fabric of our lives. And I think it is extremely important as we go forward that we try and reset that red line around threatening or inciting or using violence in politics. That goes nowhere good. That goes nowhere good for any side. And we have to be just absolutely vigilant that if someone's going to threaten violence, that is a law enforcement issue that is no longer a freedom of speech issue. Um, so I am gonna try and figure out, frankly, what my role is in helping to bring our communities back together because leadership got us into this and it will take leadership to get us out. Um, that's complicated, but if anyone thinks that kind of like, we can separate into two Americas. We cannot talk to each other. It just, that doesn't work here in Michigan. That's not who we are. It's not our state. Um, and my neighbors are devoted Trump voters, my in-laws. So um, this is something that I think Michigan has a special role um, in, in helping the country think through how we move forward and how we heal, because we have to keep that on the agenda um, or else, um, uh, you know, it, it concerns me where we'll be in a couple of years. And, and I think the phrase a time to heal is especially appropriate uh, given the, the name of the school. <laughs> I was gonna ask you a little bit about that, Peter. So I, I, wanna, I wanna touch on the themes that both of you have been raising because they're just so critical for the future of our country. And may, maybe we'll, we'll start, Peter, with that last um, a point. Uh, your, your, um, your district doesn't fully align with, um, with President Ford's um, former district, but it's got certainly quite a lot of overlap. Um, what, is it, what does it mean to you to, to have the legacy of um, President Ford as part of your legacy? Uh, I mean, when I was running my campaign, um, my motto was to return strong, stable and effective representation to West Michigan and, and you know, fulfill the legacy of Gerald Ford, Paul Henry and Vern Ehlers. Um, you know, that's an open question whether or not the Republican Party is, is still one that nods to that, that legacy, that conservative legacy. Um, but to me, it's... <sighs> It's the question of does, and this gets kind of back to the, the Burkean sentiment, um, is the role of a representative to, you know, pull the district or, or their half of that district and do what a majority of them want at any one time? Or, as is my belief, is it to exercise judgment, judgment that will be held to account, you know, on those, you know, two-year cycles, Um but with the understanding that what might be that, that, that incredibly intense emotion in that moment um, may, may age in a different way. Um, you know, I obviously voted my conscience. It was, it was a, a difficult vote. Um, I've been on, I think I'm, I'm on my second county GOP censure um, uh, and continue to talk to constituents and, and hope that there's, uh, that those you know, relationships can, uh, can be mended and that we can respect um, differences of opinion on that side. Um, but I, I strongly thought about Gerald Ford. And, and frankly, if I would have, uh, that was one of the argument that some folks were making that, you know, President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. Uh, you know, that was how, how we move on and we need to unite. We need to heal these divisions. Um, to me, he part, I, that, I couldn't square that with voting with not voting for the article of impeachment that was presented because in the case of the Ford pardon, it came after Nixon resigned. It came after Nixon accepted responsibility. You know, that was a, a way to move forward because that responsibility had been accepted by the guilty party. Um, and in this case, not only did the president accept no responsibility, um, but there was no, <sighs> you, you can't move past something without working to, to, by papering over the division. 
right? I mean, that wound will remain open. Um, it, it will never heal unless you, you confront the reality, unless you demand accountability. Um, and, and I don't want us to wind up in the same spot in another two years, four years, six years. I don't want us to wind up in a scenario where political violence is, is not fully held to account. Um, and so that, you know, that's why I, I thought that this district and, and where I hope that West Michigan and Michigan as a whole can be um, a, a place where tough decisions are made, um, where we don't just take the, the easier, the popular way out, um, but do what's right and necessary for the long term and the good of the country. Alyssa, obviously you're, you're, um, you've been, you won the first time, you've been reelected a second time in a district that uh, traditionally is quite Republican. Um, you ran as a, a Democrat um, and um, you're obviously, uh, you, you speak in, in terms that I think um, many of your constituents might not agree with all the time. How do you, how do you think about these questions of reaching across the aisle, having conversations across the differences we all have, and, and taking that special role of Michigan, as you said, seriously, to be a model for the country. How do we, how do, we do that together? Well, um, it's true. I mean, th there is a, a smaller group of us in Congress right now. There, I think there are seven of us Democrats who represent Trump voting districts, Trump 2020 districts. And I think I'm the last Democrat in Congress right now who represents a district that went for Romney, Trump, and Trump. Um, and um, so we're a smaller group, but you know, when I was making decisions when Trump's first impeachment happened, um, you know, you have to get comfortable with the fact that you may not be reelected and that some things are more important than you keeping a job. And you have to have faith in people, right? You take a leap of faith that people want people representing them who have integrity. And they may not agree with everything you believe in, but they respect you for being transparent about how you make decisions and for then going with what you believe in. And I made that, that gamble and the, the voters answered that um, in the affirmative. And um, uh, to me, um, um, Michigan is a good place to try and bring integrity back into politics because I still believe the average Michigander can't stand the violence, can't stand the vitriol. They just want government to work. They're pragmatic people that get up every day and they have stuff in their lives that annoys them and they have stuff that they love and they just want to do well and have their kids do better. Um, so if you believe in that, as I do, then you can take votes that are, that are difficult. Um, and I think, listen, I'm a Democrat who my father was a devoted Republican. I believe that we are a better country when we have a Republican Party of empathy, where we have legitimate ideological differences about the role of government in our lives, and we push and pull against each other. But we all believe in making the country a better place and have a shared vision of what that is. So I desperately want you know, my peers in the Republican Party to figure out where they're going as a party. And I mean, obviously, Peter's a great representation of a modern Republican, I hope. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think you can't close the door to other people. You can't say, well, I didn't agree with that person a year ago. So I'm just they're done. I'm not I'm not going to ever keep the door open for them. Both Peter and I are members of the Problem Solvers Caucus. These are the Democrats and Republicans who desperately believe in bipartisanship and in getting things done. Um, we've had some difficult conversations since the attack on the Capitol. It has not always been easy, um, but um, I think we feel that it is important that we show to the country that you can still disagree without it being so angry um, and vitriolic. So setting an example, um, and then uh, frankly, just realizing that people, that people can always come in the door that if you keep it open. Um, so that's what we're trying to implement, at least in my district. One, one of the things that resonated off of what Alyssa said was, um, you know, the idea of serving every term as if it's your last, right? And I think the, the problem that uh, I've seen, and, and granted, I've been in the role for all of six weeks, uh, but I saw this in some of the difficult votes, not only on the 13th with impeachment, but on the 6th and the conversations leading up to it about certification, which at the time I thought that that would be 
that certifying the election would be an act of political suicide. So I was uh, pretty, uh, that goes to show you the naivete of the pre-January 6th uh, moment. But that sense of if, if your number one goal is how do I ensure my own re-election, um, you're, not, you're, you're going to be looking at every issue from a point of self-preservation rather than fidelity to the oath of office that you've taken. Um, and, and to me, that's something I, I never want to forget. It's, you know, what, what is the appropriate policy? What needs to be done? The politics side, that's something that you, you work on later, right? But it is what is in the best interest of the country, not just in the best interest of furthering an individual career. Well, I think that um, if we if we had uh, this kind of perspective widely shared that both Alyssa and, and Peter you've expressed, our country would certainly be uh, in a much better, a much um, a stronger place. Um, we're going to go to audience questions in just a moment. Um, I thought I might pick uh, before we do just one or two um, substantive areas to, to think about. So one of them, obviously, that uh, is pending right now is the stimulus bill or the relief package um, that uh, President Biden has put forward. I wonder if each of you could offer your perspectives on whether we're on the right track with that approach. Um, are, are there things you'd like to see done differently in it? Uh, and maybe again, uh, Alyssa, we'll start with you and then go to Peter. Sure. Um, well, it's a little wonky, but we are passing this bill. Um, we're on a course right now to pass the next COVID bill through a, a wonky process called budget reconciliation. Um, and instead of doing what we've done for the last five bills of, you know, work hard, negotiate, get a bill that independently stands on its own and goes through, um, you know, the House and Senate and over to the White House, we are putting it into a budget reconciliation process, which, which basically um, I don't love. I'll be honest. I don't love. It wasn't my preference. And I still am holding out hope that we could have an independent COVID bill because I think that's the way we should make big decisions is through a bill that we can debate and amend and and um, and argue over. Um, I do think it's important that we get money out into the system, especially for vaccine distribution. I'm sure for Peter, it's the same thing. It's the number one thing people are asking me about is how come there feels like there's differences in who gets the vaccine based on where you live yep. and, and all this stuff. So that's because we have scarcity. We don't have enough supply and people are frustrated. So we need to get money out um, no matter what. Um, I don't love the method. Um, and uh, but, um, you know, we got to deal with the problem. So um, uh, frankly, the number, um, you know, I tend to be a little bit more on the fiscal conservative side when it comes to being a Democrat. So I want to understand and unpack all of those numbers. Um, it's a lot of money. We've gotten pretty used to throwing out like trillions of dollars. And I still do believe we have to think about overall the debt. Um, now we're spending right now because we need to be spending, but um, I think we shouldn't get too comfortable passing trillions and trillions of dollars without actually diving into it. And that's what I'm doing right now. No, and, and I'm, <laughs> I mean, the, the question is, well, where does the 1.9 trillion come from? Um, and, and the best, as I can tell, that's the highest number that you can claim without saying it's in the trillions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's a, a, uh, a plural um, question. Uh, if we look, Two, two kind of recent things. One, the uh, under President Obama, the, the recession era stimulus was you know, $800 billion. And, and we're already upwards of, of $3 trillion, you know, that we've been spending. Um, so there's this, this ultimate question of how, how are we arriving at the numbers? What is the right number? Um, I'm deeply worried about the, the inflationary um, consequences we may be facing. I think the some of the um, economist estimates that our, our GDP gap um, or our GDP loss uh, relative to expectations may be in the magnitude of 800 billion to, to $1 trillion. And if we are tripling or quadrupling that in terms of uh, deficit spending we're adding to the economy, uh, that could have some very unforeseen uh, macroeconomic consequences in addition to you know, our elevated debt. But I am, I'm deeply frustrated by the budget reconciliation process actually means that um, no Republican input is required whatsoever. 
Um, I, I think uh, Alyssa and I were both on um, some efforts to carve out the most urgent and necessary components, um, specifically money for, for vaccines, for testing, uh, and for PPE, and have that as a set aside because you know the shorter, the more rapidly we can get vaccines out and in people's arms who want it um, and are eligible, the faster we're going to be through the other end of this pandemic uh, and the less need there will be for the never-ending stimulus. Um, I'd also like to see um, the direct cash payments cleaved off as well. Uh, I have yet to hear a compelling argument about why a $15 minimum wage increase should be in a COVID stimulus package. Um, that seems like a separate legislative item uh, and especially worrisome for our, our restaurant and hospitality industry that are already getting hammered um, by the pandemic. I think uh, the hospitality industry is off um, anywhere from 40% to 50% uh, negative declines in revenue year on year. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can find a more expedited way to get support to people and to support the vaccination process um, that allows us to separate you know, items that are, are frankly not an immediate priority as, as the vaccinations are. And, and the prior stimulus, back, the COVID stimulus we had, the, um, you know, the 1.0 and the 2.0, the CARES Act, those are overwhelmingly bipartisan initiatives. Um, so going down a path to make uh, the next American Rescue Plan inherently partisan is in the face of the message of unity that President Biden uh, made nods to during his inaugural address. Let me um, uh, shift focus from the immediate uh, economic needs that you all just discussed with respect to the stimulus mm -hmm. and ask you to share with our viewers your thoughts when you think about the long-term health of the state of Michigan in particular and how you imagine us uh, with a different kind of economy in, in the next decades than the one we have now, which is still um, not where, where it used to be and not, not where I think anybody wants it to be. So maybe, Alyssa, if you could start us out and then we'll go to Peter on long-term long thinking about what the Michigan economy ought to look like and how we might get there. Sure. Well, we, we still are a place that makes things and grows things. And that's our, our specialty. We're the best in the country at it. And I think we saw during COVID when our companies stepped up and we needed things like ventilators and masks. And, you know, we, we had the manufacturing base to actually answer the call in a way that a lot of my peers from other states were like, can I get some of your ventilators? I mean, you know, we were, we were in demand because it turns out it's still important to make things. Um, I think we can bolster that sector. Um, and um, do that by strengthening Buy American requirements, by making sure that if you're using taxpayer dollars to buy stuff for the Centers for Disease Control, that should be mostly American stuff. And I think the Biden administration is understands we can open up that market a little bit and, and um, enhance American manufacturing, which is always going to be important. But we also have to realize that, you know, Time marches on. And, you know, the, the announcement that GM made the other day of going to all electric vehicles, I mean, I'm a little biased because I, I represent Lake Orion, which is where we're making a lot of these electric vehicles. But if, if the country is in some ways moving towards electric vehicles, let's be the one to make them, right? I don't need to give that to Tesla, you know, let's be the ones that, that make that um, and kind of capitalize on our know-how on those industries. And then I think we, we've learned a lot through the pandemic. I mean, I, I think everyone knows people who have come back home, um, who have relocated temporarily, people who have you know fancy jobs in Silicon Valley are able to do them at a fraction of the cost of living and have the great Michigan life that everyone enjoys. I think letting our small towns have a, a piece of that pie so that anyone, as long as they have broadband, which we should talk mm -hmm. about, anybody, can participate in that economy and keep that know-how, that that engine going here in Michigan. Um, and we all know that in the manufacturing sector, there are fewer and fewer jobs. Um, but we also have the biggest robotics community in the country, right? So if we're not the guy on the line, we should be the guy making and fixing the robot. I mean, we are. we have to adapt. And I think we're well positioned to do it. But it takes creativity and vision. Uh, and and I, I couldn't agree more. I think for too long, um, Michigan's losses have been, um, you know, the gains that have been seen overseas by a place that a lot of our jobs have been outsourced to. COVID showed us the fragility of our international supply chains yeah. and how 
manufacturing sectors, and, uh, and we're dealing this right now with um, with chip makers um, supporting our autonomous and electric vehicles and, and just our vehicles more broadly, how the more outsourced some of those components are, and, and maybe there was a marginal, you know, uh, gain in productivity or, or, or kind of cost decrease initially, um, but very quickly that cost gets eroded by the additional risk that's added in. So, you know, thinking strategically about how to re how to, how to onshore a lot of the, you know, uh, medicinal, pharmaceutical, um, you know, uh, higher technological uh, and other critical components of our supply chain is going to be um, a, a real opportunity, especially for Michigan in the years to come. But um, to Alyssa's point on uh, our, our cities and towns and our state in general, I want New York, and ca this is me being very selfish, but I want New York and California um, and, and Illinois, I want their losses to be our gains. Um, we have a higher quality of lower cost of, uh, of living. And those, the intersection of those two, you know, especially in a world where um, a significant amount of, of work will continue to be remote. Um, and frankly, I, I hope that, you know, the, the conversation we're having right now, you know, I'm about to run and, and go uh, tour a vaccine, uh, a mass vaccination site with the governor. Um, you know, I can do both of those things in the span of two hours, right? <laughs> because of Zoom, because of this run work. When, when Alyssa and I are back in D.C. Um, for votes, we can still be present in our community through um, you know, kind of remote systems. And so the more we, we adapt to that, the more opportunities to decentralize a lot of the employment uh, that we've seen historically uh, and the more that I think Michigan can gain. But to Alyssa's point, making sure we have a robust infrastructure to support that will be critical, including uh, high-speed internet access. Um, the, the next set of questions um, from the audience are around climate change. Uh, which both of you touched on in different ways in your remarks. But I wonder if you could uh, tell us what you think, again, both Michigan needs to do and the United States needs to do and, and the world needs to do with respect to the problem of climate change, which uh, so many uh, people are worried is the, the biggest you know, existential threat that, that the world faces. Uh, Peter, maybe you could start us out. Your views on climate change and then Alyssa. Yeah, I, I, I think climate change is real. I think it's a problem. Um, and I think it's something that we need to act in a, in a thoughtful and serious way towards. Um, you know, I, I'm one of the president's executive orders that frustrated me was shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, you know, we need to recognize that um, the more we can shift production to renewables, the better. But we're always going to need some form of on-demand energy generation, whether that's nuclear, whether that's natural gas. Um, that's going to have to be the case and that we can't flip a switch. Right. We have existing systems. We have existing infrastructure that we need to be um, doing what we can to pave the way to the future. But that that's also going to take time. Um, I'm firmly supportive and, and we are in a state that's defined by its natural resources. Um, I mean, that the, the shape of our state is defined by the lakes all around us. You know, we have the third largest fishery industry, um, protecting the environment, preventing the worst impacts of climate change and beginning to peel back um, the path that we're on, you know, is, is essential for our economy. It's essential for our future. And it's going to ultimately be uh, a far lower cost in the long term than continuing to neglect this issue. Yeah, and I would just say, I mean, listen, I come from a national security background. And when I was at the Pentagon, we co-authored the first study of how climate change should be viewed as a national security issue. Um, and, um, you know, when, again, when you're in the intelligence community or the military, you're, you're planning, right? If something even has a 10% chance of happening, you're planning against that threat. So prudent planning obviously should be accelerated and, and um, um, taken extremely seriously when it comes to mitigating climate change. I think we have to acknowledge that that means doing something about carbon and fossil fuels. Um, we can't do it at the expense of collapsing our economy, but we can have serious conversations about how we lower the carbon in our, you know, coming out of our of our state, out of our country. Um, I think we should have those conversations. Um, the good news is, um, I think the environment, as Peter mentioned, is one of the most bipartisan issues in the state of Michigan. It always seems to surprise people from like the east or west coast. They think it's this, 
you know, political thing. And it's like, no, our, our local lakes, rivers, streams, our way of life, our, our Great Lakes, people are pretty serious about protecting them. Um, and so I tend to focus on um, those issues where we have overlap, because it's the way to have a real conversation about the environment. But, you know, if, if we don't understand that environmental security is literally homeland security, after Flint and having PFAS in our water, like if you can't hand your child a glass of water without knowing that they might get a lifelong learning disability, that is a direct threat to your family. And so I, I'm for reframing the issue and being more muscular about it, right? Protecting your local watershed, protecting the water that comes out of your tap. That's what you should be doing as, as a citizen, um, protecting your family. So uh, I think reframing the issue and then keeping it um, something that we all focus on, um, I think is kind of the way that I engage in environmental issues. That's great. Um, we're, we're getting close to the uh, top of our uh, time here, but uh, we have a set of questions that are returning to the theme about conversations across difference from the beginning. And uh, one question from the audience is, present company aside, could each of you name a political figure of the opposite party who you admire and say a little bit about why and maybe uh, Alyssa and then Peter? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I've worked in Republican administrations. So I, I worked um, in the Bush White House. I was assigned there. I worked for um, senior um, uh, Republican officials. You know, someone who um, I appreciated quite a bit was actually just more current is Brian Fitzpatrick. He's a representative, a Republican representative from Pennsylvania. Um, he cares deeply about things like PFAS and water. He's one of the chairmen of the bipartisan task forces on that. Um, and I think separate from, from any one issue, like he's just a decent person, right? I mean, we've had issues where we don't agree. We've had issues where we agree, but you can tell pretty quickly when you come to Congress, and I'm sure Peter's going through this now, you know, everyone says they want to work across the aisle, but it's hard work sometimes, especially in this polarized environment. You have to be committed to doing it. And um, the way that you get through hard times like this is you just, you be a human being and say like, hey, I don't agree with you. Here's where I'm coming from. This is tearing my town apart and, and we can't go on this way. And having another human being say, I hear you. I, that's not, I didn't think about it that way. I, and it is, um, Brian has been one of uh, a number of folks who we don't always agree, but he's a human being. And when he lost his older brother, um, last term, um, we, we were able to comfort him as human beings because we saw each other and dealt with each other that way. And we need more of that in Congress desperately right now. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the folks that come to mind are, um, you know, freshmen and I don't, and some of them come from very blue districts. Um, and so I don't want to throw them under the bus by getting a compliment from a Republican. Uh, so I'll, I'll shift to the other body and just say, I appreciate, uh, folks like Joe Manchin and, and Kirsten Cinema, um, and how you have um, folks who are not afraid to buck their party, are not afraid to make an unpopular vote. Um, you know, I think we've seen in, in many bodies, and, and you see it on on the Supreme Court. Um, you see it in in our um, our houses of government. How in in a trying time, in a highly polarized time, there are folks who gravitate and realize if somebody doesn't try to create some balance. Uh, then we're all going to be out of whack. Um, and so I, I really respect those who um, are, are not afraid to, to take grief, aren't afraid to have have their party and, uh, and, and primary challengers thrown against them. Uh, maybe I'm now psychologically revealing a little bit about myself and the current moment that I'm in. But um, I, I do think that, you know, in, in sort of the long arc of history, um, you know, the history looks kinder on those who, who stand up for what they believe in uh, than those who just try to not wind up in the minority. So we have only a minute left and the last question is pretty complicated, but I'll, I'll try it. Um, you know, one thing our students are worried about is when people call for civility, they mean, you know, sit down and shut up. Don't, don't say what you're, you know, don't speak up for injustice in the way, Peter, that you were just describing. How do you wrestle with this question of how to be strong in your principles and stand up for what you believe in for justice, but also 
reach out that hand um, to people who disagree with you. And again, we only have a minute left, so give it your best shot, um, uh, Peter, and then Alyssa. Yeah, I mean, I think it's being honest. And in being honest, you can be, you can tell a very hard truth without being um, impolite. Uh, and I think folks deserve that. I mean, they don't deserve to be, you, you disrespect, you patronize somebody when you tell them what you think they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. Um, and I think that's that can be a problem with rising generations is taking assuming something that's uncomfortable is negative rather than something that's uncomfortable might be exactly the conversation that needs to happen. Yeah, I, I don't see it as um, calling for civility means backing off the, the strength and passion of your argument. I actually see it as the opposite. It gives you the tools to actually have that, frankly, moral high ground. Right. If someone is threatening violence and is heckling and is angry and is, um, you know, crossing all kinds of civility lines and you respond in kind. What have you done to help the cause? I mean, you've you've all solidified your feelings that you don't trust the other side, um, but you can have a passionate, strong um um, argument without it being nasty. And I would argue that it's more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't consider myself a shrinking violet. And I have had threats and things hurled against me um, for a long time now. And it, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't empower you to sink to that level. And the truth is, I think some of the greatest leaders in our country have been the ones that have said, I mean, think, I think of Martin Luther King, I know it's trite, you know, but honestly, like the man lived in the segregated South and he figured out a way to keep his heart open to other people. And he did more to transform our country and civil rights than any other human being. So I am, um, it's not always easy. It's sometimes deeply uncomfortable to have conversations with people who you really don't agree with. God knows I know. Um, but if you just respond in kind, you're just, that's not demonstrating leadership and it doesn't get you where you want to go. Well, uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I wish it could go on for hours longer, but you all have both been uh, generous with your time. I really uh, appreciated the openness um, uh, towards uh, each other and, and towards opposing views and the courageous stance you both have taken in different aspects of your work. So, uh, on behalf of the Ford School and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and our wonderful student sponsors, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, thank Peter. You. Thanks, Alyssa. Take care.